uh, Tony, you know. Okay. Um, and uh, so what happened was that um, they they bought me a let's see, hold on here. Uh, uh, hold on, I gotta get that. Hold on, yeah, I know. Oh, shit, now hold on. You don't have to do anything. I know, but my, my thing was working out. Hold on a minute. Hold on one sec. One sec. All right. I don't know why it's not working. All right. So, hold on. Uh, this is, mm, do I have the right one here? Hold on a second. There you go. So, um, so my talk is my life and an astronomical journey by Tony Pereira. So, a um, little about me. Um, I joined the Astronomical Society of Long Island at the age of 16, which I'll talk about a little bit later. That's 50 years ago. Uh, I joined Custer Institute at the age of 20. I'm past president of the ASLI, this club, board member of the ASLI, board member of the Creative Aviation, and I'm a past president of the Optical Society of Long Island, which was you know, Howard knows about it. Oh, yeah. You know, it was it was a phenomenal thing that I, I was president of and I ran for many, many years. So um, with the help of coming to um, uh, coming to this astronomical society in Long Island at age of 16, my dad drove me here every Wednesday night to the club. And John Bo, who's a member who's who is in Florida right now, remembers my father driving me because I couldn't drive as a young kid. Um, during those years, I gained a lot of vast knowledge in optics telescopes because a lot of interesting people and a lot of people at the club were building telescopes at the time. And uh, they had a lot of different degrees and expertise in optics and telescope making. It was really a great, interesting thing. So, and then I started Spectrum Thin Films, uh, building my, my coding machines um, in a garage and finished completing the high vacuum chamber in 1993. So now the passion begins. That's just a brief summary of what I'm about to talk about. So, like I said, I was interested. I was born that way somehow or another. And my parents bought me this 60 millimeter a unitron refractor um, and at a and a &S was a store in Hempstead. Uh, and uh, and they, they sold a lot of telescopes, believe it or not. But it's also clothing and stuff like that. It was a big store. It was like Macy's, but they sold telescopes. So they bought me the 60 millimeter telescope. I was fascinated. I used it every single day. And I, I told my parents, I said, I need a bigger telescope. And they said they really couldn't afford a bigger telescope. So what did I do? Oh, so this is the manual of the telescope, of the, that 60 millimeter telescope that I, I wrote down. I was 10 years old. That's from 10 years old. I did that. I wrote that. Okay. And I use this telescope a lot. So my mother like never had to worry about me because I went to school and where did I go? I was at the library reading. So I decided on a 12 years ago, this may not mean to a lot of people, but I designed and built a 10 inch of 6.5 Newtonian telescope. I ground and polished the mirror. Now I knew nobody that knew anything about building telescope, anything. Only thing was from reading in a library and reading books. So this is the mirror I polished, and the parabola that I polished. That's one of the images I happen to have after all those years that I have. Um, and um, I, by the way, I developed that. I developed this in my school uh, darkroom. And then after I fabricated the mirror, um, I went ahead and I tested it. And I said, I'm saying I saw Jupiter. This is before I had it illuminized. And then I wrote problems and stuff like that. I'm 12 years old. And uh, so I, I actually did analysis on what I did to verify that everything was good and fix things that I had to fix. So that's the telescope I built in, um, when I was 12 years old. Now, this is the second version of it. The first version of it was a pipe mount. And then there's a surplus store that had this metal and I made it bigger. 
And my father carried this pipe on the subway systems of Manhattan home. And that's a heavy piece of metal. That's, that pipe is really heavy. And my father um, taught me, um, you know, he built, helped me build this wooden base for it this way. And so let me go over how my father helped me out, okay? Um, the telescope, this is wooden here. I made that and he helped me make that. And if you can see that little thing, that's a plumbing strap. My father used to use these plumbing straps. I used it to hold the telescope on, on, on this cradle here. And this was an interesting thing. This is a coffee can that my father, he did plumbing work. And in those days, he had this furnace that melted lead when he did plumbing work. I said, wow, that's good. So he, he gave me the pipe. He got me the lead. I melted it. And that's a coffee can. And I melted the coffee can in. I had the shaft in the coffee can. And then I poured the lead in there with my father's help. And I made a counterweight. Okay, how I figured out how much weight I had to do to do this whole thing, I still don't know today. And by the way, that light is, is one of my father's plumbing lights that he had. So, I mean, I really don't know how I was able to do it at that age, especially when I have no one to talk to about it, but just reading books and stuff like that. So this is um, the, my completed telescope. Oh, by the way, this is the, this is the pipe mount version. So this is the first phase of it. And all these plumbing fittings my father got, got for me. And this is the counterweights that I made for it. And that's, this is the, uh, the uh, this, is, this is from, the, the straps are for plumbing. Plumbers use that, they still use that today. And uh, so, and this is a sono tube. This is where they put con poor concrete footings. My father knew about this thing and he told me about it. I don't remember where I got it. I got it and I made that the telescope tube. And um, I had no money. Everything had to be a lot of stuff. I, a lot of stuff I got was donated too. So then my father drove me to uh, Springfield, Vermont to sell a thing for my first time because I heard about it. And I won first award on, on that telescope I built. And I was like a celebrity. People were coming up to me, asking me you know, questions about the telescope. And I was like a little happy camper there back then with all these people uh, asking me questions how I built this telescope. And it worked perfectly, really did. Optically, it was really good. And then Giant Telescope, it's a prominent uh, astronomy magazine, contacted me and they asked me to write an article for, the, um, for their, their magazine. And I wrote a four page article. There's the article I wrote. I was, you know, 12, 13 years old, maybe 14 now. I don't know, maybe 14 now. And uh, so there's the telescope I built and there's the article I wrote. And these are the pictures of the moon I put, I put down. There's my name there. And 10 inch of 6.5 Newtonian telescope. And, I got people writing me letters like nonstop about my telescope, asking me how I built it, and, you know, blah, blah, blah. So then I went observing with this nice telescope, the 10 inch at 6.5 Newtonian. There's the ring nebula and I drew the ring nebula and there's the date and uh, that I did it. And this is the uh, eyepieces I used at the time. And, um, you know, so I was really young. And then I drew a picture of Saturn and there's a date and the time I looked at it with the telescope. And then I started to get into photography. So I figured out how to attach the camera to the telescope. And that's a uh, Jupiter picture I took. Beautiful. And that's Venus. You can actually see the cloud and Venus over here. I don't know how I did this at such a young age. I really don't, but I did. That's great. And, uh, and then this is our out of focus image of the moon, but I did take a lot of good pictures that were really good. But um, that's just the what these are happened, the pictures I happen to have. And look at a picture of Saturn. That's a pretty good damn picture of Saturn. You know, and um, um, I'm not sure what all those things here. It's probably dust or something. I'm not really sure. But I know that that's the image I took of Saturn. So uh, the 10 inch of 6.5 Newtonian was not big enough. And I had to go bigger. Now I'm in high school. So now in high school, um, I, I said to myself, I, did, I was doing like number crunching, what, how we're going to do it. I wrote letters to companies to donate bl mirror blanks and stuff like that. Well, the company called United Lens, who is now my, who's still my customer, uh, uh, they're still in business. They gave me this mirror, 16 inch uh, mirror blank at a Pyrex. Uh, not only they gave it to me free, they had it delivered to my house, a truck delivered to my house. And then I said, wow, okay, there you go. Now I'm back going. There I am in Robert Avenue in Elmont. So in high school, I took the mirror and you don't see it here, but I ground one side of it concave to a sphere 
and I tested it with a, a, uh, um, a full call tester to make sure it was a sphere. When that was done, I then taped it with all this masking tape here, really good. And then I had the machine shop teacher and the mechanical drawing teacher, um, the math teacher helped me, and also the computer, uh, there was a computer on board there. So in the machine shop, I made this copper core drill, and that's carborundum, like sandpaper. Now I'll tell you how much time I had, had on my hands. This is a drill press. This is three inches thick. That's copper, and I would take that in water and slowly push it down until I was able to you know, go through the mirror there, go through the mirror. And there I am, young as I am, uh, working on it. My teachers were like fascinated what I was doing and they had no clue what I was doing. Tony, yeah. at this point, were you getting any kind of um, input or support locally or were you still no. getting all your knowledge from reading? Reading. Okay. There was nobody I knew of, really. I mean, um, you know, um, some people, I was coming to the club, and some people were telling me certain things, but not not really. That's mostly what I read books. So then um, I had to make I had to do all of this. So now I made I made I'm making a 16 inch Newtonian cassock ring. That's a complicated telescope to make. Two two telescopes in one. And this is some of my notes. This is the cassock ring uh, section of the telescope, and this is my math. By the way, there was some math at that time. I didn't have the math. I, I didn't know the math. So the math teacher was telling me how to do the, all the math. So I had to learn the math to do what the calculations I had to do. So then this is the, uh, some more math I'm doing for the Cassegrain. So basically the light comes in here. Uh, this is a, 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 um, a paraboloidal mirror, reflects off that, hits a second convex secondary and bounces off, goes through the mirror. But what I did, instead of going through the mirror, I actually put a copper tubing through that, I mean, a, aluminum tubing and I made it into a tertiary mirror, so I was able to look at it on the side instead of to the back, because mounting-wise, it was easier. I mean, so I made that. So basically, that's another drawing I did. I can't believe I did this drawing, showing all the dimensions of the mirror, the distance, the diameter of the mirror, the distance from here to here, you know, the, the focal area. I did the diameter of this thing here, and uh, the the um, I had to calculate the, the, the uh, diameter of A of, the, of this convex secondary mirror for the Cassegrain section of the telescope. So I did that. And there's some of the some of my math is there. You know, we're talking about slide rule error. We're not talking about calculators then. So so what happened was I learned that I couldn't I couldn't mathematically calculate all the calculation I need. My high school had a main mainframe computer. So I went over to a guy and said, look, I need, I need you to write me a program to do these calculations. And the guy says, There's a, 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 the, the computer is for the school district. That's all it was, not for any of the students. There was no computers. <laughs> there was no computers back then. So basically what I had to do was, um, he gives me, here's a book on basic programming, learn it, program it, and I'll put in the computer. I'll put in the, uh, put in the computer. So I did. So this is the computer program I wrote, and there's the data. I mean, this is the data came out. You know, I was like a think tank back then. I, I don't understand. Yeah, it was v, uh, VS Basic programming that I wrote. And um, so then I had to calculate. I decided on okay, I got to make the telescope as perfect as I can. So I was I was gonna calculate the the um, the percentage, the size of the secondary mirror, how much is gonna obscure. The primary mirror and after my calculations it was six and a quarter percent after my calculations which is well within the range that i needed to be so then i wrote i started to write uh i started to write down i was i was writing down what i did to keep you know so i had you know i had the information in handy and then i started to write another article i think i did this for the science fair uh uh in the school so then um so this is the um this is the, uh, I did like a ray trace here. This is the, the primary mirrors here. This is the Newtonian section. So the light comes in here, bounces off the paraboloidal mirror, hits the secondary, comes up, and there's where your eyepiece will view. This is the, the uh, aluminum tubing with a diagonal. So the Cassegrain section, you view it over here. So this shows you the two different telescopes in one. So this is the Newtonian version, and this is the Cassegrain section. So I, I, I was, I'm able to, I'm, 
I was able to observe through the side of the tube to the back, which made the telescope mounting humongous. So, so now I had to figure out, I said, man, this telescope is really heavy. I figured I got to figure out balancing. So these are all the numbers I wrote down. 70 pound mirror. I, I measured all the weights that I was calculating where the center of gravity was. That's what I did. Don't ask me how I did that. I'm, I'm, I'm a kid. You know, I mean, that, I mean, I, I was learning math that I didn't have in school. So then this is the machine I built to make that mirror. So that's a 16 inch mirror. I made that machine and I'm polishing the, the, uh, the, the mirror. And if you know, so, so this is the um, mirror I had. Uh, I'm not sure if it, if it, if this is an interferogram of it, of a Foucault tester I made it. Now, by the way, you see this indenture here? Well, I cored the back of the mirror all the way through that three inches, except for leaving a quarter of an inch. So that laid that little area there. I didn't want to core, I knew enough not to core the whole mirror straight through and then polish it because then the, you would turn down the edge. So I, what I did was once I had that cord in the back, I, then I, I polished this to the a parabola and then I don't know how I did it. That cord's really sore in the drill press. I went on the other side now, the front of the mirror and I, I cut it out. Now, I have the cord drill in my, my lobby at work. I still have the cord drill, you know, which is really good in memory. So, so now I had to decide a mounting. So I've been at Stellafade reading mounting. So this is a fork mounting. And I really liked it. So I did a drawing of it. I, I was considering doing a fork mounting. So what I did, I started to make a fork mounting. So here I am manufacturing this fork mounting. I had to weld to weld this thing, this and that, blah, blah, blah. And then here's the base of it. And after it was all done, I realized, man, this thing is so heavy, I can't even move it. I said, it's not going to work. And I said, don't have to, I built it all. So then um, I have to, I have this humongous tube. And if the eyepiece is there, I can't see it. So this is a drawing of rotating rings. So the telescope mirror, the telescope tube will, can rotate. So the eyepiece is in a good position. So that's a drawing that I did because I made rotating rings on the telescope when it was done. So now I came up with a new design. So this is my, my latest design. I can't believe I did this kind of drawing at that age, but I did this drawing. So this is the mounting. This is a, the pedestal, the legs, and this is welded at a 45 degree angle. And there's, there's a pillar back block bearings here and here that do it. So I like this design and I went with this design doing it. So this is, uh, you know, these is very old pictures too. So this is in my father's garage. That's the tele part of the telescope mounting that you're seeing here. And I was clever enough to realize that you see how this is off centered, right? All this is back here. Because the telescope is so heavy, I need as much weight in the back as possible. And I knew enough to keep this as close as I can to this, which is, a, which is really a clever thing to do. And these are pillow block bearings each side here and here. Um, I had people, because of my age, they were, they were doing work for me for free. So, so there's my dad, great guy. I, still, I always miss him. And um, that's a completed telescope after I finished high school. Look at the size of it. Wow. I mean, he's about my size. That's about five feet seven. So <laughs> you can see how big it was. So um, this is not fully done because I had rotating rings I made. And these are the plumbing straps over here. Um, and um, that's the mirror cell. I had, that's a custom mirror cell I made for it. Again, that's the lead weights. Um, there was a surplus company in uh, Flushing, I, not Flushing, in, uh, on Long Island. There was a surplus company that was able to buy stuff really cheap at the time. So then I got involved taking pictures of eclipses and uh, Fred Shaft writing this book contacted me and I, I photographed a total solar eclipse and he put it in a book and it's a whole bunch of literature what I did. So then, um, so now I, I went to college and like Ken said, I went to work for a company and and the guy was a really good businessman. So there was, the company was, uh, was, was uh, failing. So what I did was um, I decided on building a coding machine in my garage. So in 1990, I started building a coding machine in my garage. And it took me, it took me a couple of years to build the machine, a complicated machine, a garage. Um, and um, 19, 1993, I leased a small industrial building space where, my, where I put my machine in there. And... Um, I was extremely depressed then because I had my three-year-old daughter, daughter die of cancer. I was very depressed, still am. Um, and, um, and then getting customers to work on me 
was very difficult. Um, I did write a hand letter to one company who I didn't even know about, and he wrote me a hand letter back and says, when you're in business, let me know. We'll see what we can work out. And he started sending me business, and he still sends me business today. So I started out in a small building in Bohemia. I was there for nearly 15 years. I had one unit, went two units, three years, units. Um, and then um, the first year, I was barely making a, a float. It, it was really upsetting. I had bills, people calling me, you know, I then I had a vision. My daughter said, Daddy, you're going to make it. And I did. Um, and um, in 19, uh, 2005, I purchased a. And so the. Oh, so let me back up a little bit. When I went to college at night, because I said I could be the best businessman, best engineer in the world, best scientist, but a lousy businessman. So I went to college at night for business and I learned something called just in time. And uh, so I purchased this building in 1995. Oh, wait, let's see if I have it. Uh, so so uh, in 1995, I purchased this. Oh, no, I'm sorry. So then what I was saying about the company when I first started, how difficult it was. At night, I'm taking school business classes, and I learned something called just in time. Well, I came out with something, which will be enough, another side later, called Thin Film Express. I was the first in the industry to come to the idea that if you send me your optics, I code it in 24 hours and send it back to you. Well, what? You know what happened? I got comp I got this call for this company at Optics in a week. He was sending me gobs of work, and I was I was doing okay. So, nineteen and in, um, in two thousand five, I purchased the building in Hopog. It's a big building, sixteen thousand square. Uh, we have a building in Hopog. My odds of my my new company succeeding was very low, but I always used my motto, my memory, of my daughter. Failure is not an option. So I I I was, I, I just had kept my nose down. So this is the building. Uh, Spectrum Dim Films in the Hop Off Industrial Park. It's in a wonderful area. Everything's all manicured lawns. It's very clean. Um, and um, so uh, this is what I'm saying. In, in, in college, business school, I learned just in time. And that's when I came up with this Dim Film Express. That made my company. That idea was the best thing I've ever come up with because all of a sudden, I had one customer who, who said to me, start sending me work and more and more work. And it really got to the point where um, I, I was now paying my bills. Uh, I was, it was so bad when I first started off. I had, no, I had no money to feed myself. I had to go to a local bar that they had hot, free hot dogs and hamburgers. I used to go eat hot dogs and hamburgers and I go back to work. <laughs> so, um, so this is uh, one of the machines I built. That's the, that's the machine I built. That was machine number one I built in my garage. And um, it's still operating today and it still hasn't failed yet. So this is in the clean room now. We have uh, 48 hectare filters in the ceiling and uh, we have about 26 employees right now. And this is not kind of a you know, bad, skewed picture, but there's all these people sitting in these clean boots, setting up very talented people, setting up cleaning uh, optics and for the coating machines. These are the coating fixtures that actually go in the machines. Everything in the, in the entire company I designed over the years and built. These are the coating fixtures I designed. So all the glass goes in here. You can see one in there. And we used acetone and methanol, Kim wipes to clean everything. So we have uh, uh, state-of-the-art spectrometers that make very accurate measurements of our coatings. Um, these are piece of equipment that I buy um, and they're very expensive, but we need them because they're the last, once we're done with the coating, they do the measurements. And today, today's market for customers know everything. So we have to make sure everything's accurate. So this is a line of all the coatings I've built over the years. These are some of them. There's more of it than there. I mean, I don't know. I had, um, no, I was a hyperactive kid that I, I focused on doing this together. Uh, you know, so I built every one of these machines over the years. Um, this is a, um, a Questar 7-inch. I did all the Questar 7-inches uh, telescopes. Uh, this is a big, uh, I didn't break that. That was came in that way. This is a huge 60 pound prism for an observatory that had a coat. This thing was enormous and expensive. These are, um, I, I used to do for teleview optics, light pollution, light pollution filters, uh, O3 filters, hydrogen alpha filters, uh, planetary filters, which I'll go into later on. This is in, this is in a very sophisticated uh, IBS sputtering machine. By the way, this, this IBS sputter machine, I bought the machine, but it's like, you know, I understand English. Now I got to learn French. It's totally different technology using RF energy. So 
This mirror here is for the Navy. We did this job. So this fixture I designed, we coat large astronomical mirrors up to 36 inches. I coated John Boat, those of you who know him, his mirror like two or three times already. And um, these are, I did work for astro, uh, astrophysics. These are the astrophysics refractor lenses that I coated. Um, that's that big prison I showed you before. Inside the coating machine has it being heated up. You know, it's, look at this thing and look how low it is. It is. It's, you know, failure is not an option because I make one mistake. I break that prism. We're talking about big bucks. And this piece of optics I took a picture of for an observatory. This thing was worth over $175,000, that piece of glass. And we coded successfully, shipped it out to the customer, the, the observatory, and then that was, you know, that was it. So this is the inside of the machine that I built. This is this, this planetary I designed and built over the years. This, met, this is where you evaporate silver or aluminum coatings as an ion source. This electron beam gun over here that does the evaporation in the shape of an ice cream cone. And this is where we monitor the, the, the phase thickness of the coating. So we do large lenses. We do thick lenses. This is a, a calcium fluoride lens. It's worth a fortune of money. So we, we, I've known, I have technology knowing how to handle them. They are bifringent. They're, they're really, they're crystalline structure material that can break really easy. We owe, I have a very high success rate. Uh, not a clear picture, but it's all a bunch of lenses. This is, um, uh, I coded this. This was a Smith camera I coded for an observatory a while ago. This is like 30, 30 inches. That's it. That's it. It's, that's in the coding machine. And um, we coded um, uh, this lightweight mirror blank. Um, it's one of my technicians that's that's working on it. She's in it, so excellent about it. It's not a great image, but... Um, we had a coat that would enhance aluminum. One of the guys was a doctor, Mario Mato, and, and I know from cellophane for all years. So he asked me to coat his mirror because uh, the uh, other coating lab screwed it up and I had to strip it. So inside the coating machine here is the electron beam gun. It evaporates in the shape of an ice cream cone. This is my big machine, it's 54 inches. This is a huge machine. This is where you do metallization. Um, there's two electron beam guns. This is the, fi the fixture I made from Mario Mato's um, telescope. There he is, that's Mario Mato. He's a cardiologist. And um, the, the, the mirror that he sent to another coding lab, they screwed it up. And I had to chemically strip it. And they, they, they put stuff underneath the coding they should have never done. And I had to come up with a chemistry. He was freaking out because he spent a year making the mirror. I was able to chemically strip it. He's, a, he's one happy camper because they stripped the mirror and we recoded it. And um, and uh, everything worked ever since. And then he had, and then uh, a couple of years later, he had a leak in observatory and then he didn't know about it with the tar on the roof or something leaked on his mirror and it etched the coating. So I had to strip and redo it again for him. I did it twice for him. So I made this hoist there that will flip the mirror upside, upside down. There it is. We take it apart, put it in the crate, goodbye. So there's another machine that I made. Uh, now, I don't make these. They, I buy these uh, frame. Uh, this, uh, this part, I buy, buy surplus, and the rest I, I make and design. This is IBS sputtering technology. This is, uses RF energy, really complicated machine. And basically what this is, is uh, an RF beam hits the target, ends up on these planets. So all this I design, but not this, this side of the design. And that, so basically, that's what it's. The cylindrical beam hits the material, bounces off, goes on the parts over here. So the mirror I showed you before is that one of the one of the highlights of the things I've done was that I um, I coded for the Navy. What happens is uh, what, the, what happens is when when they want to shoot down a plane or anything, they shoot a missile, millions and millions of dollars. Well, they came up with this idea of using a telescoping uh, telescope to do it, and they contacted me because they knew my expertise in manufacturing telescope. This was the most complicated thing I've ever done. So um, they had the optics fabricated, but the coatings were extremely difficult for this high power laser. So basically this telescope would, would shoot down, you wouldn't even see it, it would shoot down a plane. It can actually, if there's a boat in, in the water that may be a drug boat, they can actually disable the engine only and then go to the boat. So um, it's a, it's a catadioptic telescope. That's what it looks like. See, that's my coating, I coded that. But there's a whole bunch of coatings here. And the mirror I showed you before is behind here I did. 
there's a whole bunch of coatings I did for this whole job that was extremely complicated. And I have to do design rate proposals. Here it is again, another picture. This has been on YouTube. This was top secret. I couldn't tell everybody. Now it's been released. So as you can find it on YouTube showing it, it's pretty cool. So now, greetings from Mars. I, I, I got it. I, uh, we always get a, a lot of RFQs from NASA all the time. And we got an RFQ for, for doing the optics for the Mars Phoenix Lander. But with they, the way NASA does things for an important job like that, there's six companies that go out for it. After you do the coatings, they test it out and then they eliminate them. So out of the six, then they, out of, I was one of six. I, and then they eliminate three and I was the three left over there. And then after we did the three, I uh, said to them, I won the flight model, which was phenomenal for me. And the second one was the uh, was for um, uh, the backup, but I got the flight model. My initials and my daughter's initials are on Mars today because they put the initials on the lens. So this is the Mars, uh, you know, you know, it's a Mars Phoenix lander was to discern if they had uh, um, water on Mars at that time. So that's what the Mars Phoenix lander. So what I did was I did the camera in here, these two things in here I did, and there's a microscope attachment somewhere in there. I did the optics for that too. Now, the, the, this chlorus was going to Mars and digging deep and see if they see any permafrost in, in Mars. So the lenses I did are in here. I, I made the lenses, I, you know, we had the optics and I did all those coatings, fancy coatings that they needed. And so there's a, a overview of it and there's a solar panels for it. It's a six month mi mi mission. Uh, by the way, the, uh, I didn't show it here, but um, when, when the arm went into the, in the uh, Mars, uh, Mars and they pulled it off, it showed the permafrost that discovered water on Mars. And that was with my optics that did that. So I'm at I'm at the Cradle Aviation, a dinner banquet, you know, and they call me on stage to have Chuck Schumer congratulate me what I've done for the space program for the Mars Phoenix Lander. I got pictures of them shaking my hand and asking me questions about what I did. Uh, I was like stunned. I didn't expect it at all. So uh, this is a, 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 it's out of, out of sequence here, but it's a blurry picture. I had a better one that shows the permafrost on Mars. So I also did work on the Mars, uh, James Webb Space Telescope. I did a small section, a small piece of it that has to work at li liquid helium levels. Uh, and most of my optics have been on a lot of these observatories throughout the world. So what I did was um, I did work for um, high-end astronomy uh, telescope makers. And um, those you may know it and may not, I'll tell you what was that. Um, I started to design and build things, my telescope, everything. Well, I invented the dielectric diagonal, which I use in every telescope today. And we'll go along way past my lifetime. And basically, this is the, these are these coatings, the mirrors getting coated. It turned out that um, when I started it and they started to market it, I couldn't make them fast enough. We were doing thousands and thousands and thousands and they kept on telling me they need more because nobody else, there was nothing like it uh, ever done. Um, and uh, there's going to be a demo here about that. So here's the dielectric diagonal. It's 52 layers of dielectric materials that does the coating. So basically, um, this is a di this is the um, computer model of it. So normally, the normal luminized coating is over here. It's a little above 80 percent. Look what I look at look what I'm giving you here. It's like 99.5 percent. So you're getting like 15% more light output with that diagonal that I developed, that technology. So it went well and it, it ran for 15, 18 years until it, I don't like, I don't like patent anything because if you find out what I get, um, then um, I'll go on to something else. So the Chinese finally figured it out about 15 or 18 years later than they, so they're doing it now like a fraction of the course, I don't care. So that's that. So then I, 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 uh, I took over a big iron optical for a while there. And then I made their PSD, the small telescope. I made it to a 60 millimeter, we sold them. So this was the original one and I designed this. So that made it to a much bigger telescope. So we sold a lot of them. That's what it looks like all together. That's when the manufacturing, those are lenses in it, those are it. We did the assembly, I got involved with that. And these are light pollution filters that I developed here. So. This is the um, O3 UHC filter. 
And this is a planetary filter. My planetary filter was one of the best. Nothing was ever developed like that before. We sold tons of them. Makes you look Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars much better uh, images of, uh, of looking at Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars uh, with that filter that I developed, the dielectric filter. But um, I decided I'm not getting involved with the amateurs, professional telescope makers anymore. I'm doing more, you know, high-end commercial stuff like that. I'm, 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 I've gone beyond that. Uh, this is the um, this is the planetary filter I developed. So basically, what you can see here, it transmits different wavelengths of light: the red, and this is part of the green, and then it blocks it blocks a little bit more. So you get it's it's it's, it's increasing the signal noise noise ratio. So the contrast draw, increases on the plant on the plants when you look at. It. And that's a, that's the the company my company was building this with Nate Barron selling them. That's what we used to sell the off. There's a filter switch with the filters I developed. And this is the uh, uh, this uh, solar 60 millimeter solar telescope that I did. And I have open houses every year. And I get a call from Story Musgrave wanting to come to my open house. He came to my open house in no charge. Came to my facility, gave a lecture. I had I had 100 people show up at the open house for him with him. and and. He slept over my house. That's even better because then I heard all the stories about uh, him repair. He's a guy, Story Musgrave, did uh, incredible human being. He did six shuttle missions. He's got two doctorates. He's a medical doctor, a medical surgeon. I mean, he's just totally beyond brilliant. And uh, so it was. It just was spectacular. He was able to come there. And then I had people and you know, in governors and oh no, these are. People in, uh, you know, these were involved with politics. Politicians came to my company. The politicians wanted to have a meeting and display my company to all the politicians. And so I said, okay. And they came over there and these politicians and uh, you know who that is? That's Steve Levy. You know, if anybody remember who he is, he came down there and I'm showing, and plus I was on all the TV channels. News 12 was, um, I had my facility another time doing entertaining there. I've been in Newsday, blah, blah. I don't really like any of that stuff, but I, this was fun having this, the politicians. They were all politicians there and the media. There's Steve Levy. And then uh, I, uh, they wanted to learn about what I did. That's him being interviewed. So then uh, Newsday wrote an article, Long Range Vision for Business and Relationship. They contacted me and they came down there with a news reporter and uh, they interviewed me. That's an interview. And they, they was in the news day, paper. So um, my company actually has a little bit younger there. Uh, has um, um, We have a newsletter that goes out once a month. I had a customer appreciate your weekend at my house. All these customers showed up for the first time at my house. And uh, we, they all partied and had a great time. That's my building. So more passion. So what's next? Just, I'm going to shoot for the sky, shoot for the stars. One of the things that I did do, which I, I've got to mention, though, because of my problem with cancer, was that I have developed an optical filter for the first time. Surgeons can now see cancer cells when, they are, when the surgeon is doing an operation. They have a, an LED light source with an optical filter that I developed, and then they wear goggles. So when the, the, the doctor, the surgeon, let's say, is doing a, removing a tumor, let's say, from a patient's brain, okay, after he removes a patient, he can see the cancer cells and determine if he has no cancer cells, little cancer cells, a lot of cancer cells, so they know what to do, either chemo, more radiation. So I developed that technology. And right now it's still in clinical studies. Well, the stuff I didn't, I did thousands of filters, but we do a lot of work for, now I haven't done it. I, I started to do work for SpaceX, but SpaceX wanted me, if you remember one of the missions, they had this big dome in there with the, uh, one of the astronauts with cameras taking pictures of it. They were going to do an acrylic dome and they wanted me to code it. And I, and I says, I start, they gave me the, the, the initial contract. And then I says, it's not possible. And you're using plastics, which is not good in space. So when they launched it, they listened to me. Not, they didn't use plastic, they used glass, but they didn't get it coded. The reason why you want to code it was the fact that you don't want the radiation hitting the astronauts. Well, they launched it with uncoded. So those astronauts get bombarded with radiation, which wasn't a smart thing to do for them. I told them, and they were listening to me, the, the, um, the astronauts have these gold shields with transparent gold. That's what I told them to put on it. 
he wanted me to put something else on it, which I didn't agree with, but anyway, so that's it. All right, now, 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 one last thing. And this is the dielectric diagonal that gives you 15% more light. These are the telescopes. One is a standard telescope, all right? And the other one, I dismantled and I recoded the whole thing, okay? You'll see the difference in the light output looking at that exit sign. Do not touch the telescope and move it out of the way, okay? So go in here, you go in here, you look at it, and then you go look at the other one like this, all right? And you can see the difference in intensity from one to the other. Which is the code, which is the end code? Well, they're both, they're both Don't coded. Don't give it away. I would, yeah, yeah, I'm not gonna give it away. You tell me. All right, in fact, you come over here, you'll be the first. You got to, or you can sit there if you want to sit. And you no, no, that's okay. See the exercise? Yeah. Now look at intensity and now look at the other one. No, oh, I can look at it again. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's what you have to do. You have to go back and forth. Well, 15% you, you is very small. What? For the, for the human eye, 15% is small because but, our eyes are logarithmic. Thank you. But <laughs> but what I did was, I know, but what I did was, yes, but the primary mirror has 15% more. The secondary has 15% more. And then the lens I read down, oh, you're, oh, they're all, all recoded. Everything's been recoded on the whole thing. You know, Tony, I remember way back. See, this has regular, this has, these are multi layered dielectrics that I did. I remember way back when Broomer collapsed. Yep. And you left Broomer right. and announced you were going into your own business. Right. I was shocked. And I said to myself, that takes guts. I would never have the courage to do something like that. Oh, and you've good. made a real job of it yeah. and succeeded, I'm sure, beyond your wildest dreams. Yeah, absolutely. Right now, uh, we have 26 employees. I am giving my door to the entire company, the building and everything. She's been working for me for almost eight years now. I'm never going to retire. I love the company. I love what I do, the technology. I'm in the middle of working on, like I normally do, she's managing the whole company. I'm building machines and updating the equipment so we're going to triple our size for the next few years oh, great. so no one else is going to be able to do the stuff i'm doing so that's what i'm in the middle of doing right now and uh no it's 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 it was it was tough in the beginning it really was it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't easy but things are uh we have so many customers worldwide now and it's all by word of mouth we don't even have a box here with so much customers how do you stress test something that's going to be on mars to know that it's going to hold up your we have to their environmental uh specs on it so we have to test for abrasion humidity and adhesion okay and the spectral spectral responses to everything else <clears throat> it's very stringent specs on it so the government gives you the criteria they, you they give me up they, they give me a full print right on everything that's necessary to meet on it we know we can do it we do the quoting on it and then we sent the quote out that we're going to meet that spec and then we have to certify it. We have to go through an environmental chamber. We have environmental chambers that work. We can go down minus 100 degrees C, humidity, abrasion, and adhesion. So, and that's what we did. You know, that's how we do it. We do it all the time. We, we, we work with NASA all the time. The only problem, I don't even know where, where a lot of stuff is going into anymore, but we do a lot of different things that, for NASA from time to time. And where's that telescope you built as a kid? I don't know. Like one of the guys in the club bought I bought the telescope for me a long time ago. And then, then I heard it resurfaced. And then the 16 inch telescope somehow or another ended up some other place. And the guy called me up. He says, Oh, I got your, your 16 inch telescope. You want it? I said, No, nah, it's too big for me. <laughs> so I don't know. It's probably still around somewhere, I think. You know, I'm sure it is. I, I, I just don't know. I have the core to the 16 inch telescope in my lobby right now. And I, that's one thing I'm really proud of. So if anybody wants to stay real, wants to look at it. Okay, just put your hoodie down so you don't hit the telescope. And um, you got to look, you got to like go back and forth, but you'll see the difference. What's the heaviest single piece of mirror you got to have? 300 pound mirror. And I wasn't happy about it. They, they, they forced me to code it. 